and social cohesion. I am Winfred Villamil of the School of Economics of De La Salle University, your session moderator. Allow me to begin by explaining to you what this session is about. My explanation is based on a paper prepared by the program committee entitled Understanding the New Globalization Implications for the Philippines. According to the paper, one major feature of the new globalization is the weakening of social cohesion and trust among private individuals and between private individuals and public institutions. In the past, globalization was always thought to enhance trust by forcing communities to work together, cooperate in harmony with each other in order to reap the benefits from economic liberalization and integration. But globalization is also a disruptive process that often brings with it the unequal distribution of wealth and power leading to disenchantment, pessimism, cynicism, and the erosion of trust in institutions. The lack of social cohesion and trust in turn makes it difficult for governments to implement reforms that are needed to restructure the economy, to enable it to adapt to the changing environment. Many of these reforms have painful short-term effects, and governments are unlikely to implement these reforms under conditions where a major social upheaval is, likely, is the likely response to the policy. On the other hand, the failure to implement much-needed reforms may deepen social division, especially if some of these reforms are meant to address important issues such as growing inequality. This will lead to more social conflicts, which in turn will dampen economic growth and development further by generating uncertainty in the economic environment. Reforms, no matter how painful, are more likely to be accepted when citizens trust their government, perceive it to be genuinely interested in promoting their welfare, and believe that their short-run sacrifices will bring them substantial benefits in the long run. Numerous studies have shown that societies that rank high in trust and social cohesion achieve better economic performance. They are likely to be more resilient in the face of external shocks and also more likely to pursue pro-poor growth strategies. The reason is obvious. Trust and social cohesion is essential to the implementation of reforms that are needed to address the challenges brought about by globalization. Moreover, as Kenneth Arrow pointed out in a widely cited paper published in a long time ago, 1972, let me quote this, virtually every commercial transaction has within itself an element of trust. Certainly, any transaction con conducted over a period of time. It can be plausibly argued that much of the economic backwardness in the world can be explained by the lack of mutual confidence. In this regard, the Pitts paper presented the results of a cross-country correlation of GDP per capita and the share of people in each country who agreed with the statement, most people can be trusted. The results of the correlation analysis reveal that countries with higher trust also have higher per capita GDP. 
Interestingly enough, the Philippines, which has a GDP per capita of only $6,000, had the lowest share of people that agreed that most people can be trusted. This puts us in the same league with countries such as Ghana, Zimbabwe, Ecuador, and Colombia. This reminds me of a response that I got when I asked a Chinese Filipino friend of mine many years ago why the Chinese in the Philippines were so successful in business. His answer was that mutual trust was deeply ingrained among them. They are confident that debts will be repaid and that most everyone will abide by agreements and informal contracts. As the PIDS paper points out, where there is trust, less resources are needed for the enforcement of contracts, the prevention of properties from being expropriated, and the resolution of conflicts. Where there is trust, there is stronger incentives for innovation and investments in physical and human capital. When there is trust, good governance follows. But trust has to be earned. It works both ways. A culture of trust can only grow and thrive in a culture of honor, where most people, especially political leaders and policymakers, have developed a reputation for making good on their promises and abiding by agreements and contracts. Government officials who have earned the reputation of honoring their policy pronouncements and commitments reduce business uncertainty, encourage domestic and foreign investment, and enable corporations and other businesses to adopt a long-term planning horizon. A big factor in the erosion of public trust in institutions is the increasing use of social media platforms as a vehicle for propaganda with the intent of influencing social outcomes. Social media has increasingly become a platform for the proliferation of misinformation disinformation and malinformation, sharpening the socio-political divide in the process. The process also works both ways. On the one hand, you have disgruntled sectors and the political opposition using social media to undermine trust in government and its institutions. On the other hand, you also have government or its institutions <laughs> propagating fake news to undermine the credibility and intentions of its critics. The inevitable outcome is the erosion of public trust in both and the deepening of social discord. Given the power and influence of social media in shaping socio-political narratives and outcomes, it is vital for us to educate the public on how exactly these alternative media platforms are used to manipulate public opinion and propagate disinformation. We also need to know what can be done to safeguard media platforms from being exploited as a vehicle of disinformation. To expound on this, we are fortunate to have as our resource person, Dr. Jonathan Corpus, who will talk on social media platforms and trust. But technology also has a great potential for fostering trust through more transparent and faster public transactions. In this regard, we have invited Mr. Alan McQueen to enlighten us on how pub blockchain technology can be used to facilitate transactions with the public sector, increase efficiency and transparency in these transactions, and reduce fraud, corruption, and transactions costs. 
So let me now proceed to introduce our first presenter. Our first presenter, who is not around, by the way, is Dr. Jonathan Corpus Ong. He is an associate professor of global digital media in the Department of Communication of the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, USA. He is the co-editor in chief of the journal Television and New Media. His expertise is on the social and moral consequences of media in the everyday lives of vulnerable communities, particularly in the global south. He has recently written the public report, Architects of Network Disinformation, Behind the Scenes of Troll Accounts and Fake News Production in the Philippines. Funded by the British Council, he is the author of the book, The Poverty of Television, The Mediation of Suffering in Class-Divided Philippines, and co-editor of the volume, Taking the Square, Mediated Descent and Occupations of Public Space. Like I said, Dr. Ong is unable to join us, but he did send a videotape of his presentation which we're about to see. One, my name is Jonathan Nong. One, my name is Jonathan Ong. Thank you so much for having me here. So uh, my presentation today is entitled Disinformation Producers as Ordinary Digital Workers Behind the Scenes of the Philippines Fake News Industry. So I'm sure you've heard of the term um, patient zero. So um, a Facebook executive and Claire Amador can tell you all about her. Um, so uh, Katie Harbath of Facebook um, coined the Philippines as um, patient zero in the fight against the, uh, uh, digital disinformation. <clears throat> and this refers to how the Philippines is in track in the forefront of fake news innovations. So um, I will try to argue today that we need to understand fake news as an industry. We need to understand its players, its actors, um, the producers um, of fake news websites, of emotionally arousing headlines, of very um, uh, sophisticated and um, very well-oiled machines of campaigns, digital campaigns. Um, they're not exceptional individuals or products of exceptional villainy. Um, in fact, at the most basic, they're really a result of the complicity and collusion of ordinary creative workers of people in advertising and public relations, or even in, in the media, um, who do consulting um, for, for, for politicians on the side. So this is a very lucrative industry, um, political consultancies, and particularly digital um, uh, campaigning um, for political clients. And it's only getting bigger. So this is what we've found out. I want to summarize here some conceptual shifts that I invite us to think about um, in studying fake news and disinformation. So the first is um, an ethnographic approach that tries to interview workers, that tries to understand how fake news operates as an industry and not just as a novelty of new technology or of this populist political moment, right? There's ways of explaining it in the present. So we argue um, in our two reports that it's important to think about it in terms of its ordinariness. It's actually part of campaign practice. Black propaganda, black ops, um, these are um, uh, entrenched in Philippine political culture. We just need to understand what is new about digital campaigning. So um, I bring in my own um, expertise as a communication and media professor here um, to think about um, 
political operations not just as a product of charismatic political leaders, but as um, produced and enacted by economic incentives in industry practice. So in media and communications, we think about film or television not as just produced by an exceptional director. Um, the humanities will have their auteur theory, right? So um, these are um, ideas, products of exceptional individuals. But in uh, media studies, um, we think about productions as collaborative and also as products of competition. And so we want to understand fake, fake news as part of work hierarchies, as part of broader organizational structures. Um, and, and by doing this, we're able to identify loopholes in, in existing industry practice, um, which can be exploited by the current political moment um, to enact certain political objectives. So the third conceptual shift that I invite us to take um, in this um, short talk is to think about ways of regulating fake news, not as content. So fake news as content will emphasize censorship, will emphasize takedowns, will emphasize banning actors, banning particular kinds of speech that we consider or label as fake news. And this is a very fraught practice. Um, I also have done research on Thailand where this practice is being weaponized by the government itself to muffle the opposition. This is very concerning and I'm very worried that this um, kind of approach, censorship style of approach, which is also anti-democratic, will be the primary way in which we solve, try to solve fake news. Instead, um, what a media production perspective brings to the table is let's understand how campaigns work, the process of campaigning, the process of putting advertising online, the process of collaborating with influencers on Instagram and paying them to do political campaigns. How can we, instead of banning them or censoring them, create more transparency in the process? So that's what I want us to, um, to think about. So our um, report, um, Architects of Network Disinformation, um, suggests a new definition um, of studying disinformation, that it is actually the organized production of political deception that distributes labor to a hierarchy of digital workers. So it's actually um, a collaborative and a competitive um, team effort that has three particular features. Um, one is that um, this is very much entrenched in advertising and public relations. The people who lead digital campaigns for politicians have um, existing clients um, in the corporate world. So they also are the campaigners for soft drinks, for shampoo brands and they transpose what they have learned from um, using hashtags for Coca-Cola to using hashtags for Villar, for example. Number two, um, no one is a full-time troll. So um, we found that trolling is actually a project-based and sideline jobs. So um, these are three-month to six-month projects um, which have very specific objectives and very specific deliv uh, deliverables. And the deliverables are measured using advertising and public relations metrics of reach and engagement. So again, this is not exceptionally new, um, but these are entrenched in existing corporate marketing practice. Um, but having said all of that, um, political campaigning and, and fake news for, for politics is much more insidious, right? Because it is about seeding historical revisionist narratives. It is about creating divi uh, divisiveness between different kinds of political camps. Um, and people have, um, we've, we discovered, have very creative ways of justifying themselves. What we say is moral displacement. Um, where they argue that they're never um, the biggest villain in the story, that they're not trolls, and that somebody else is a bigger troll. 
So I'll be going through this um, very quickly. These are the hierarchies of workers who are involved in campaigns. And this is a kind of campaign which are advertising and PR driven campaigns. There are different models of fake news production, um, which I don't have time for today. Um, this is the advertising and PR model, which is the most prevalent form of creating a digital campaigns for, for clients, particularly during elections. So at the top of the food chain here are um, advertising and PR strategists who are the chief architects of disinformation campaigns. So they are they recruit and lead entire disinformation teams. They assemble the right um, mix of individuals who can enact uh, particular political aims. They are the ones who in interface with political clients, as you can see in the infographic. So they manage the overall project budget and Coming from advertising and PR and having a portfolio of corporate brands, they lend legitimacy to, to black ops projects. They're able to say, well, look at my portfolio, having consulted for Smart um, or for Globe um, in the past, this is a kind of reach and engagement I can promise to you in your own campaign. They can manage up to, um, uh, we've heard figures of 2 million pesos for a three month um, project, which sounds big but is actually super cheap compared to um, a television advertising so television ads could be one million pesos for a prime time ad that's for one ad so this is a three-month project that can really go deep into um, uh, communities and fan communities online so they have a real um, value for money um, uh, hiring them for digital campaigns um, at the second level um, they will um, mobilize uh, folks um, we call digital influencers, which is the term for like online celebrities, right? So on one hand, there are those key opinion leaders, these online celebrities who might be seen as celebrity endorsers. So think Mocha Usan or think Ethel Buba, depending on which political camp you're uh, a part of. There are different kinds of influencers. There are also lower level influencers we call anonymous digital influencers or micro-level influencers. And they're less famous as those mega influencers such as Mocha or Ethel Buba. Um, but they are nevertheless important when they simultaneously tweet um, the same hashtag, they can um, artificially engineer um, and, and manipulate trending rankings on Twitter. So um, digital influencers are also hired by corporate brands. So again, it's very much in, entrenched in industry. So there's the phenomenon in the past five years of the emergence of many digital influencer agencies in the Philippines, many located in Manila, who act as intermediaries between corporate brands and these teams of influencers who have uh, millions of followers or several thousand followers on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, um, etc. Et um, eventually, they were also roped in for political campaigns. Um, this is from our 2019 um, project. What we found was a new innovation in 2019 is the shift from the mega influencers, those with millions of followers to micro or nano influencers, those with only tens of thousands or even 10,000 or less followers. And micro and nano influencers look more authentic, more organic, more real. Um, they look more innocent, um, but they are actually also roped in and enlisted for campaigns. And they evade regulation. So politicians will never claim that they had actually paid out micro and nano influencers. There, these could be parody accounts. Um, these could be like Malacanang events and catering services, a fake Miriam Santiago account. Um, pop culture accounts could be um, Senora Santibanez on Twitter. Thirst trap Instagrammers are those sexy celebrities on Instagram um, who will be posting shirtless uh, pictures of themselves and then at some point will be posting um, uh, campaign propaganda for politicians. And of course, hindi ito declared to Comelec as official campaign spends. And hindi din sila take down on Facebook because mas micro 
um, yung operations nila. Hindi, hindi masyado halata na fake news yung sinasirculate nila. So, at the um, lower level of the hierarchy are those we call community level fake account operators. And so, their aim um, is not for millions of followers. In fact, their aim is mostly in the comment section. So, they, they will be the first to comment on news articles um, which are favorable to politicians. Of course, they will express their fan their fandom for a politician that they are paid for, or they will also critique and troll politicians they are um, they are trying to target um, of the opposing camp. So the term that we use in our report is illusions of engagement. So important din sila because sila yung share, sila yung like. Um, therefore, nabuboost nila sa algorithm. Um, uh, yung mga posts ng mga influencers mas lalabas sa mga news feeds ng ibang tao um, kung uh, kung nag-engage itong mga fake account operators so they can be paid um, daily rates of 500 pesos or 1,000 pesos a day depende kung nasa Manila pa sila or sa probinsya um, so hindi lang ito actually advertising and PR led. So many fake account operators um, operate within politicians' own staff. So we found it super common in the 2019 election where politicians um, demand and pressure their own staff who do legal work, legislative work. Um, but then they're saying, hey, it's campaign season. Um, you should do your best to help our candidate to win the election. Um, one innovation in 2019 that fake account operators um, were really um, operating at um, in a very insidious and malicious way are in closed groups on Facebook. So Facebook closed groups um, um, are actually real communities. We observed overseas Filipino worker groups. These are groups dedicated to, for example, nurses in London, nurses um, in Cambridge um, in the UK, um, or even like weird conspiracy theory uh, groups. For example, we infiltrated a Filipino flat earth close group on Facebook. So what happens in these groups is that these are organic discussions. These are people who are actually sharing a bond with each other and share life stories with each other. But at some point in the feed, there's always suspicious political propaganda being posted. And when we did um, some tracking of some of these accounts, the people who are posting some of these political propaganda are sometimes the moderators of these groups. Sometimes they're not the moderators, but they're participants. And they they are linked to other sites related to politicians. And so, kahit organic community sila, itong mga close groups na ito, mad madali din sila ma-infiltrate ng mga fake account operators. Um, so, fake news is of course produced, right? They are produced by teams of workers, advertising strategists, influencers, fake account operators, but they also depend on the real fans. And actually what we found is that um, the real fans take forward um, what is fake news, what was planned by these um, advertising strategists and take them in very unpredictable ways. So um, the memes that um, influencers and fake account um, operators um, craft and create sometimes are taken forward by fans who are really expressing their real um, support for a politician but also real vitriol um, hate and violence and a lot of the kind of hate speech sometimes come from real fans themselves. Um, at the same time so, um, we argue that because uh, this is these are project-based operations. Um, it's also sometimes a thin line separating what is a paid producer and a real fan expression because I could have been paid three months ago um, to do this project, but then I'm not being paid right now, but I'm still a fan of that political client, if you, if you know what I mean. So um, summarizing um, from, our, from our 2019 research, Ito yung mga moral justifications and legal loopholes that we have heard when we talk to campaigners. So um, when campaigners um, uh, uh, talk to us, they said, you know, Comelec would only issue guidelines, but they're not really laws. 
recommendatory lang naman sila. So, if Comelec told them to, um, they're now supposed to declare digital campaign spends, which is a good thing that Comelec did for 2019, some of the campaigners felt, oh, we don't need to actually follow this um, because um, these are just recommendations. These are just guidelines. Um, number two, um, campaigners say, you know, hindi naman namin na meet yung, politi uh, yung politician directly. Paminsan yung businessman backer lang ang meet namin. So, um, this for me highlights a loophole in um, campaign donation and campaign finance um, and, and also political consultancy. So, what does it mean that political consultants can be enlisted um, to serve certain politicians, but then there's no direct um, interface and that is going on? Um, there's a level of plausible deniability here that is very convenient. It shields both campaigners and from politicians um, to be truly um, accountable for the things that they create and the things and the expressions that they um, see um, in social media. So one lawyer that we um, interviewed said, you know, politicians are required to sign off on their TV, radio, and print ads. But why aren't they held responsible for the content of their digital spends? So this is one loophole. Again, if we understand the campaign practice and process itself, makikita natin na may mga loopholes na pwede na, pwedeng masolusyonan. So, um, so just some questions here. I would just want to end with question is, maybe we're tackling the problem a different um uh, um, from a different angle. Maybe we should take, uh, we should address the problem from a different angle. Rather than um, directly hold accountable politicians, what if we also directly hold accountable um, the industry and say that, you know, um, digital influencers, you guys should be declaring um, whether you are being paid by brands and therefore, um, you should also be doing that. You should also be transparent about your engagements with politicians. So maybe um, the the trail, um, the sequence of events, maybe it might need to begin with the industry itself. But the, the challenge here is the industry is not interested for self-regulation. Um, they're earning so much money from this. Um, they think that they're, um, that they're not... Um, um, that they won't really be held liable for the things that they're doing um, and they think that they're um, invincible. So could we put more pressure on the industry um, to introduce more transparency and accountability mechanisms? Um, the second question is, what if cures are worse than the, di than the disease? What if the actual solutions or, or laws that might be passed, such as um, Tito Soto's anti-fake news bill, which is modeled after Singapore's um, censorship style of, of bill, which gives government incredible powers of takedown and, and control of online speech. What if that's actually worse than the disease? So I think some of the Philippines' um, slowness when it comes to regulation comes from this um, from our own history of valuing free speech. Um, we take after the, the U.S. and, and their own um, histories of, and protections around free speech. Um, and that's why the word regulation is such a bad word, even to journalists. Um, so how can we go up around this issue? Um, and the third um, issue is about fact checkers and platforms. How can they maintain credibility or how can they regain um, credibility? Um, there's new fact checking initiatives, but how can these fact checking initiatives also ha be transparent in themselves? Um, how can they um, be prevented from slipping into political partisanship? Um, in other countries such as India, fact checkers have become um, politically partisan, where fact checkers and media organizations say, we're only going to fact check the other side. Do we want that? What are the risks around that? Um, what are the opportunities around that? Um, I'd love to hear from you. Um, thank you so much for, um, for listening.
Our next speaker is supposed to be Michael Tan, and he is supposed to uh, talk about uh, his presentation is about Philippine trust, the Philippine trust crisis, an anthropological perspective. Unfortunately, he's unable to make it, but I think he submitted his presentation and he did not. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. So, per, per, perhaps now we can proceed to our next speaker. Uh, he's Mr. Alan McKean. He's Senior Policy Analyst at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. He writes and speaks on a variety of issues related to information technology and internet policy, such as cybersecurity, privacy, blockchain, fintech, e-government, internet governance, intellectual property, and aerospace. Previously, he was a telecommunications fellow for Representative Anna Eshu. McQueen graduated from the University of Texas at Austin with a BS in Public Relations and Political Communications and a minor in Mandarin Chinese. Join me in welcoming Mr. McQueen. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, again, I'm Alan. I work for, the, uh, for ITIF. Uh, my colleague Stephen joined y'all last year to talk about the fourth wave industrial revolution, and I'm glad that I'm able to come here today. I, I specialize at ITIF on emerging technologies, uh, particularly around uh, things such as blockchain, and that's why I am here today to have this conversation. Um, I wrote this presentation based off a report that we released earlier this year called A Policymaker's Guide to Blockchain Technology. It really runs the gambit. It's a long report. It covers regulation. It covers how the technology works. But I have come here today to talk about how uh, the public sector can adopt blockchain into its processes to improve public trust. And so um, in, in pursuit of that, I'm going to talk about how the technology works. I'm going to explain its value add, like what is actually good at doing. I'll talk about a few public sector applications that we've seen roll out today. Um, and then, of course, I'll talk about how governments can adopt blockchain or help it go forward. Now, I'm not going to cover everything. Obviously, uh, everyone's heard of Bitcoin. You know, everyone's heard of uh, some of the crazy stuff that's going on with uh, funding on blockchains. So I know all about that. Feel free to save your questions. We can talk about regulation. We can talk about all of that question. Uh, so if you have any questions, let me know. This is a really complex topic, obviously. Uh, so I'm going to spend a, a large amount of time just explaining what the top, what the technology is, because if we if we if we get really like into the weeds on it and we understand it, it'll kind of demystify some of that hype around it, right? The last like three years, everyone's been, oh, blockchain, blockchain, blockchain. There was a iced tea company in New York City that put the word blockchain in their name and their value of their company shot up millions of dollars. It's absurd. The hype is crazy. I, I hope that you walk away from this presentation uh, with a better understanding of what it is and what it's good at and what it's not good at. All right, so let's start. Um, oh, uh, ITIF is a nonpartisan public policy think tank devoted to the intersection of public policy and technology. Uh, we were rated number one uh, science and technology think tank in the world by the University of Pennsylvania, whatever that matters. Um, but uh, thank you again for having me. Um, today I'll talk about blockchains and trust, I'll talk about what it is, some of its major applications, and uh, how policymakers can help adopt it. All right, so um, blockchains, basically, fundamentally, they're just a shared digital ledger. So before blockchains ever existed, you would have to rely on some sort of trusted intermediary. Think of the bank that you trust uh, to have a record of what's in your bank account. Or think of the government office that has a record of your land, right? Um, 
sometimes people don't want to put their trust, say, in a credit card company, and you'd rather have cash on hand, right? Because you have to put faith into an intermediary that you maybe don't trust. Well, this is the technology that is able to work around that. Um, it basically decentralizes the authority into each individual who's participating in the network so that you don't have a centralized or hierarchical computerized system. It's a lot of words to explain exactly what this is. So what blockchain does is it addresses something called the Byzantine General's Problem. It's an old conundrum that goes back, you know, thousands of years, maybe uh, maybe less than that. But uh, it's the general idea of there's a whole bunch of generals as part of this loose-fit army that want to attack a castle. Um, but they have to do it all together or they have to retreat altogether. Because if they only partially attack or partially retreat, everyone gets killed, right? So how are you able to put trust into those other people to ensure that everyone attacks or defends. That's what this system, basically that's what blockchain is able to do. Blockchain eh, is part of, there's three different technologies or components that make up a blockchain. There's a cryptographically linked data structure. So basically these are the quote unquote blocks in the chain. So every time you put transactions into the ledger, those transactions uh, link to previous transactions that happen. So say, I want to send money to this gentleman over here. Well, our transaction actually references like transactions from all the way to the very beginning of the blockchain. So it, it becomes linked to all previous transactions. Basically, it makes it so it's very difficult to break. The second is peer-to-peer -peer networking. Because we're all in the system together, uh, we each act as nodes on the network. This each individual computers, um, and we are where this. We are the people that make the decisions in the network. It's it's not some centralized application. And the way that we do that is with the third thing called the consensus protocol. And all that is is it's a way that we can come to agreement on a generalized set of information, without having to trust any, like centralized figure. So if you think about it. Uh, with Bitcoin, they do something called uh, proof of work, which is everyone races to solve you know, some sort of really complex computer program in order to uh, make it happen. All you need to know for this purposes of this is once all three of these things are combined, each of us are able to share the exact same record with everyone else without needing to trust anyone, any individual person because the system will automatically update everyone's record. Any questions on that? It's kind of complex, right? Right? All it does is it basically, when I send a transaction over the network, everyone's computers agree before it's added to that network. All right? So, the system removes the intermediary and it, it fundamentally functions without that intermediary and without needing to trust anyone. Because at any point, you can have an audit in the system. So if I want to check records from five weeks ago, it's on my computer. If I want to check records from five minutes ago, it's on my computer. And everyone has the same record, if that makes sense. All right, perfect. Um, but that also means, and this is, this is often the problem when it comes to thinking about how blockchain systems work, it also means that we all have done this really redundant computing process where we all have the same data and we're all doing computing. So it's really inefficient. It's like super inefficient. So every time someone's talking about, oh, we'll just do this on a blockchain, it doesn't make sense. There are only a few types of applications where you would want that redundant computing task. So it's not for everything. There are two types of, broadly speaking, blockchains. There's the public blockchains, the ones like the Bitcoins of the world, where everyone can participate, everyone can be a node, everyone can write or read the information. Um, these are generally set up where there's like a, a developer who just throws it into the wild and people choose to use it or don't use it. And then there's private blockchains, like the ones at IBM or Consensys, or oftentimes these are the permissioned ones created by governments. 
um, that places restrictions on who can participate or who can change or access the system. All right, we're almost through the explainer, then we'll talk about applications. Um, all right, so when it comes to government blockchains, the best thing about it is it creates this permanent time-stamped record that cannot be unilaterally altered. So anyone can have access to this record without being able to adjust it for other people, right? Um, this means everyone gets a copy and everyone has that same level of access. Uh, this creates trust just fundamentally because you can audit the record whenever you want and you can have full transparency into the system. Um, and broadly speaking, there are four different types of government blockchain applications that utilize that trust. They're up there. Um, I'm not going to go into payments, but I'm happy to talk about it if you all want me to. Because payments is like the most rudimentary level of, of blockchain-based applications. Everyone's thought, thought or heard of them uh, in the sense of cryptocurrencies. And while governments can adopt cryptocurrencies, oftentimes if they're looking for digital transactions, any digital transaction will be just as good as a blockchain-based one. Now, um, because you, you don't necessarily want a government to roll out its own payment infrastructure on a blockchain. It would be a redundant task. So um, there are four, broadly speaking, of these applications. The first one is shared data services. Uh, these are just repositories of the world. And then finally, uh, one of the, the newer ones is electronic voting. And the, the general idea is keeping a, uh, a record in the system of everyone being able to vote. I would, I would caution against implementing any blockchain-based voting application because uh, the technology isn't there yet. And it's just it's not there yet. But I'm happy to talk about it if you read my report. Um, it goes into a lot more detail. Uh, the second one is, of course, smart contracts. So because blockchains are... Um, are programmable, you can basically do if-then statements. So if something happens, an outcome will automatically happen. And what this uh, has significance for in terms of public sector applications is primary or primarily around escrow services or notary services, where there's a third party that needs to do something in order for something else to occur. So if you look at like real estate, there's a couple of uh, places in the United States and a couple of places in Europe that are experimenting with having escrow, complete, uh, escrow services be completely removed and put on a blockchain so they don't have to pay that intermediary to hold funds for them. It's working fairly uh, well. The third application is authenticity. So this is one of the more controversial ones in the sense that um, each token on a blockchain, you know, your Bitcoins or your whatever uh, cryptocurrency is being exchanged uh, and put on those ledgers, right, uh, could theoretically represent uh, some sort of goods or data in the real world. And so the idea behind a lot of these authentic authenticity applications is to track real world goods and add providence to them and ensure that you know where they are and how they are and, and, and then that they're, uh, they are what they are. So the, a, lo a lot of drug companies and, and US regulatory um, and as well as Europe and some Latin American countries uh, are using blockchain right now to track drug trafficking um, or counterfeit track drugs throughout the supply chain to try and remove some of that counterfeiting, some of that fake drugs, uh, which is a huge problem, especially in the United States. Uh, number four is digital identity. Um, so this is actually a big use case that's going on right now. Uh, Dubai has adopted a digital identity program. A couple of other uh, governments are experimenting with it. I believe um, Estonia has, uh, per has uh, put a some of their information for their digital identity on blockchain. Um, but the general idea is using a, uh, instead of having those tokens that we talked about earlier be something else, they're actually someone's digital information. And what this means is, or they're not, sorry, they're, they're an attache of someone's digital information. So when you're exchanging information on a blockchain, you don't have to have it say like, my name is Alan, I was born in 1989, right? You can say, um, this information is stored on a database over here, way over here, and I want to prove to someone 
that I'm old enough to buy a beer. Well, all they have to do is show a token from that database, say it's from a local bank or whatever, that proves I'm 21 without revealing that actual information. So it can be a privacy protective way to show and prove uh, digital, uh, digital identity. And so a lot of people are experimenting with that. I think it's still in its very, it's very much in its nascent stage. And because of the, uh, some of the, the problems we talked about earlier with scalability and with um, just moving any particular application onto a blockchain, it, it, can have, it can have issues. I think the best digital identity application to date on blockchains is when you're, um, it's an efficiency uh, one for like, for devices. Being able to identify devices on a blockchain is incredibly fast and, uh, compared to other uh, services. So um, kind of a, a through line of all four of these is something that I'd like to point out for private sector applications is the benefits of blockchain are uh, in addition to the benefits of digitization, right? So blockchains, you really have to find that value add for the addition of that trustless aspect, right? Without, um, without just the having the uh, addition of uh, the value of just digitization. So you can put block, uh, you can put um, digital land records on a blockchain. It can be very efficient, right? Or you can just create a digital service for land records, right? Uh, it really depends on what you're trying to get out of the service. Uh, there was a, a guy I was talking to with a very major uh, technology firm in the United States that said that they don't want to build blockchains for just every service. They, just, they really need to find a value add for the blockchain. Um, so we'll talk about public records just really fast because I think this is a good example of how governments can get involved in blockchain applications. Um, typically, public record services, they're, they're centralized, right? Everyone goes and stores their land records with the land registry. And oftentimes, especially, um, uh, especially in governments uh, that are slow to digitize, these can be very problematic. The, the records, um, they're usually centralized. Uh, you, they require you to put faith in the government, won't change your records or s and steal your land. Um, they're not redundant. So like in Haiti, uh, when there was an earthquake in 2010, they lost all of their land records because they were all in paper and they had one copy and it was gone. Um, or there could be uh, corruption in the government. So like in Honduras, uh, the, there was a period of time where some officials were changing records uh, to steal people's land, right? Well, with blockchain applications, you can have all of your public land records in a, in a format that everyone can have access to. Because the entire system is updating, you're not having access to the government system. You are part of that like, authoritative record that automatically updates. So you don't have to put your faith in the government to know that your, your um, records are up to date. Now that does require digitization, but the benefit of the blockchain is unique to having an access to authoritative set of records without having to trust a government or a bank or anybody else. So that's kind of the idea that I was trying to get at. Um, so how can policymakers help advance public sector blockchain applications? I think there are three major ones, and um, I was talking to a gentleman during lunch, and so I'm going to throw in a fourth just for, but I don't have a slide on it. Um, the first one, of course, is just by ad adopting it, um, adopting and understanding the technology. So government should work um, towards first understanding how it works um, and looking to see where it can add value in their current programs. And then, of course, adopting it. By getting involved in adopting new and emerging technologies, oftentimes governments take the risk out of that technology and enable it to be adopted widely in the, uh, the, the country that uh, they are adopting it in. Uh, we've seen this in other cases like with G, uh, GPS and, uh, and uh, you know, the internet, for example. Second, um, is government should support research in blockchain, uh, blockchain research and development. There's still a lot of problems with the current 
best blockchains that we have out there. Oftentimes they're not scalable or they're not redundant enough. Um, and so like, for example, with, with Bitcoin, it takes an insane amount of energy to do anything, anything. So it's incredibly inefficient. Uh, the Bitcoin blockchain burns enough as much energy as the country of Georgia in a year. It's incredibly inefficient because of that consensus mechanism. On the other side, um, IBM blockchain, for example, uh, because it's permissioned and they only have a few nodes, is highly efficient. You can do really a whole lot with it, but also it's easier to break because you don't have all of that redundancy. So uh, putting a lot of interest and investment into scalability problems and explainability problems, um, as well as uh, efficiency issues can help with the adoption of this technology. And finally, um, interoperability and standard setting. This is a place that in every single technology that has ever existed, governments can play a huge role in bringing the private sector together to help um, create these interop data interoperability um, standards uh, so that people can adopt the technology anywhere and everywhere. Now, I'm gonna add one additional one um, because One of the issues that fundamentally underlines all digital adoption, no matter what it is, uh, in any sense of digital commerce, whether we're getting to the blockchain or not, is creating certainty around uh, whether an application or an uh, e-commerce sale or anything has that legal certainty. In the United States, um, since 2000, we've had the Digital Signatures Act, which basically created a nationwide framework for accepting digital signatures. But it, it didn't include anything like blockchain, because they couldn't have foreseen it. It wasn't a really that technologically neutral of an approach. And as a result, we've seen a lot of companies coming out of the woodwork saying, well, if we trade something on a blockchain, will it you know, be enforced? Will it have legal certainty? I've heard that there's a lot of challenges here with digital signatures, um, primarily because it's a trust issue, right? Uh, well, with certain technologies like this, you can help ingrain that trust. You can have developers put trust directly into the product. But if the product isn't legally sound at the end of it, then it won't be adopted at all. So creating that digital that legal certainty, which is something I talk about in the paper, the, block, uh, the Policymaker's Guide to Blockchain a lot. Creating that legal certainty is, is vital to adoption of any emerging technology or even um, e-commerce at all. Uh, so thank you for coming to my talk. I, it's a really complex topic, um, especially something to, to boil down to 20 minutes. So if you have any questions, I'd love to hear them. Um, comments, I, I can go in more detail on any of the, any of it, so thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. McQueen. We can now proceed to the open forum. Uh, I may invite the audience, if they have any questions, to come forward. Uh, please state your name and uh, institutional affi affiliation for the purpose of the Secretariat, which is going to publish the proceedings. Okay. Um, at the same time, since we only have one resource speaker available to answer your questions, may I also encourage you to comment on the first presentation, share your views, uh, and I will also encourage you to comment on the other audience's comments. Okay, so we can have some kind of audience participation in terms of the issues that were you know, discussed here. So, yes, sir. We have a microphone there. We have two microphones available. Thank you. Uh, I'm Vic Pakeyo. Uh, fascinating uh, presentations. <coughs> I have... Um, uh, excuse uh, me. You're with Philippine Institute for Development uh, yes, Studies, right? Yes, I'm uh -huh. with Philippine Institute. Um, I have some questions and, and comment. Let me preface my uh, comments with a question, with a couple of questions. And this is directed to both, actually, uh, speakers. Both speakers. 
Can you unring a bell? That's the main uh, question. Excuse that me? is to say, can you, uh, can you go back mm -hmm. to a culture uh -huh. where truth telling was much appreciated and purbying lies is a death toll to influencers, politicians, celebrities, etc. Cultural. Yes. Can you Cultural. go back to the, the the culture that I think is becoming past? Ooh, so. Um, you can't, the solution, the, and, and the, the answer to this question is kind of difficult. Yeah, that's true. Because I don't trust now the, uh, the industry that you want to regulate. I don't trust the regulators. I don't trust the government that uh, appoints those regulators. Mm -hmm. And even I don't trust the voters anymore. So what to do? Is it reasonable then to say, maybe we need to be less trustful and go for what President, or was it President Reagan says about the Russian, trust but verify. Be skeptical, be critical, and be strict with evidence. So that I was literally about to say, oh. trust but verify. Um, so that was very precedent of you. Uh, what I would say is that in both fake news and um, the adoption of blockchain technologies, if you can tie those two things together, the through line would be to establish auditability and transparency. Um, the, the entire presentation and what I found very useful um, from the other gentleman was that he was looking at it from a point of how do we create more transparency in the system so you can break apart some of those like black ops, some of that, some of that misunderstanding and, and, and help people understand uh, how the system works, where they are in it, and what they can and cannot control. And the same thing is true of blockchain technologies, although it's significantly less important. I'm gonna get that across right now. But you're able to create an auditability factor so that you know if someone's messing with you, right? You know if you're part of that public record that exchanges the, the land registry deeds, if it suddenly your record misses, is mismatched from the government's official record um, because that audit chain. So that's the only thing. I don't know if you can unring a bell culturally, but you can help people better understand uh, the system in which they are living. Yes, OK. Please. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Ted Dulay. I'm with Ascend. So we're a small re research company. Um, I actually have a bunch, I actually have four questions here, uh, mostly related to your presentation. But I think it also addresses uh, Sir's uh, question earlier. But uh, let me just get this out first. I just need to clarify if my understanding of what a blockchain is is correct. So based on what you said, a blockchain is essentially a record. But it's a record that everybody in a certain system or in a certain uh, network, for lack of a better term, can or has access to at the same time, every time. And so whenever any change is made to that record, everybody knows that, that change was made. Hmm. So if that's the case, for a blockchain, security and transparency are essentially the same thing. Uh, do I understand that correctly? Um, it, it depends on the, the blockchain model. But it's fundamentally uh, the way that they're designed is uh, so that you, every block has to simultaneously agree to any change. Uh, so it's, it's incredibly redundant and secure in that sense. There are a number of, of ways you can break blockchain, so I'm not trying to say it's more you know, s protective on the cybersecurity front, because you have 
applications sitting on top and people are bad at code. And you have, I mean, there's a lot, there's a number of very famous ways that people have broken blockchain systems. So I'm not here, I'm not saying that they're more secure. I am saying that they're more transparent in how they, they run and operate. Um, sorry, I, I guess maybe I should define security, or at least my definition of security for the purposes of this discussion. When I was talking about security here, I was thinking in reference to our public records, for example. Um, the idea is, um, I was talking to Mr. Cameron a while ago, actually, and uh, he was talking about Estonia's public record system. I know we're all aware that the national ID system is, uh, well, in the, the process of implementation, I suppose. It's a good way to say it. And one of my questions was, how do you protect everyone, right? And interestingly, there is a lot of convergence here between um, the way the Estonians do it and uh, the way a blockchain works. Essentially, you are, it's not that your information is secure maybe in the digital sense of the word where nobody can access your data, but rather security here comes from the fact that if somebody makes changes to your data or if somebody accesses your data, you're immediately aware of this. So in this case, this, this uh, transparency, which is by definition what it is, provides security because you know somebody accessed your data, I know who did it, I know what for, and I know when it happened. And so we can pinpoint this person. So um, Mr. Cameron's point a while ago was, uh, there was a case like this in Estonia where some of these public records were accessed and the people who were responsible were arrested within two days. Why? For the simple reason, you know who did it. So in this case, it's the transparency that leads to the security, which is why I was asking if there was some sort of, uh, whether, whether we could conflate the two, at least in this situation. I would be, just as a cybersecurity person, I would be very wary of conflating those two because oftentimes, the threat is someone accessing that information. Sure, you can find out who it is, but if they've misused it in some way, it's not secure. So it's not necessarily about that. And that's why I, I went to great depths to say, look, public records, that information is public. That's something that everyone should have access to who controls what, right? That's information that's out there and, and public. Whereas your personal information, your digital identity, you don't want it to be stored in a way that everyone can access it. Of course, of course. No, um, sorry. No, I, I, this is not to say that I don't think we should secure our data. <laughs> no, yeah. But yeah, I, I, think, I think that just gets my point out there that um, we are in a forum about trust. And sometimes the only way to build that trust is through transparency. And maybe the security I'm referring to here is the security your internal security that I can trust who, access, uh, who has access and the people who access my documents, my data, or something like that. Cybersecurity, another thing altogether. Obviously, we don't want our data flying around the web anytime. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so I guess the other question, which I think is more pertinent to all of us, is uh, you talked about how blockchain has been used so far. Uh, do you have any suggestions as to the criteria that we can no, because you said the system in itself, based on your description, is incredibly inefficient um, because it accesses so many nodes at the same time. You need approval from so many nodes. That's an incredibly inefficient and redundant system. So, what criteria can we uh, what criteria can we take into account when we think about uh, trying to apply blockchain? Successful you... blockchain implementations have a number of different traits. Uh, one of them is that there's multiple parties participating in a network who maybe don't necessarily know all of each other or trust all of each other. It's a fundamental underpinning of a blockchain. Um, the second one is it's a permanent record. So any application that has that sort of auditability and transparency component is, is, is good to implement in a blockchain. Uh, well, not everyone, but oftentimes if there's multiple parties and they want auditability in their transactions, this is what you go with. Um, and the third one, uh, I would say, is if multiple parties in a system want an authoritative record so that they can make decisions. So not they don't want to rely on someone else's you know, centralized record. They want to have their own. I think those are the three uh, major criteria. Uh, I would also say... Um, it depends on how many entities are participating. So if there's like two or three people, you don't want to operate a blockchain. If it's like 100, it might be a good idea 
for certain applications. But I often find the sweet spot is like a collaboration of a few dozen entities uh, that know each other. Those are often the most efficient, most scalable models. Um, yeah, thank you. Yes, please. I am Toots Albert of PIDS. Uh, the, I, I found the, f the papers, both pa papers very fascinating, but uh, and in a way, the, the whole context is really boiling down to a chicken or egg thing, building trust. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in the case of Estonia and maybe in the US, it might be to some extent easier to, to think of building trust with technology. Uh, but in the case of the Philippines, I, I, I understand the, the, the point being raised by Vic that there is this sense of mistrust by some, by citizens, uh, partly because like, for instance, many of us here, we had a commission on elections voters list that was, that was hacked. Um, it became, I think, the second largest hack in the world's history <laughs> of a voters list being hacked. And the, the, same, the same company that developed that system is not, has now won, I mean legally, <laughs> they did win the bid for the national ID. They did. Yeah, so, <laughs> so of course they, it, was, it was a fully transparent mechanism, but some of us now are wondering, oh, <laughs> is it a warning signal? But then the question now that I have is because I'm not too sure whether, you know, uh, the institution that's, that's supposed to be doing this national ID is the Philippine Statistics Authority. Uh, do did they understand the whole, I mean, of course, the reason why they, 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 they're subcontracting some of the work is because, uh, you know, this is something beyond them. Uh, uh, so you do need a little bit of help. But uh, now my question is, what if the institutions themselves are, you know, I mean, just like, just the case, just like the case of digital currencies when many now are, you know, topping up applications on, on, on blockchains, essentially, but they're, they're creating something false and, and, and scamming people out, you know. And in the same way, if, if, uh, if regulators or the institutions that are starting to build on these ideas of services, blockchain somehow, but they don't know, What's going on? It's too technical for them. So, so where, how do we, how we, how do we build capacities so that people can can sort of get a better sense? And I'm, I'm glad that you're here to sort of to give us some ideas. But still, I'm I'm getting worried more and more that it may be Pied Piper leading the blind. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so that's how do you regulate against fraud? Um, it's, it's a tough topic because especially as you can see from my presentation, the more technical something becomes, the, the easier it becomes to scam people, right? The people took their blockchain bucks and, and said, oh, we have a blockchain application, give me money, and half of them were defrauding. Um, I think the tough part is because you have, you have to put your faith in the regulatory system on some degree to help crack down on misuse and uh, consumer protection issues, right? Uh, in, in the US, we have a backstop with the Federal Trade Commission who enforces uh, something called unfair and corrupt practices. And that's when a company lies to you or tries to defraud you, you um, have this mechanism by which the government can go after them. If you don't have faith in the government's mechanism to do that, uh, then it becomes third party uh, warning systems. So oftentimes you see this with uh, like nonprofits uh, that have sprung up. I can think of a couple in the United States, primarily around like consumer misuse. And uh, this is, it happens a lot in the privacy land uh, because the US doesn't have an adequate privacy framework. So oftentimes it's nonprofits uh, or uh, other like consumer rights organizations raising the alarms about misuse of people's data. And so if you can't put faith in the government to enact consumer protection, 
uh, then you have to start relying on third parties to help boost that transparency of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Now, there will always be fraud. It's just going to happen. If it wasn't blockchain, people would gravitate to another technology. It's just fundamental. Uh, so you have to create those regulatory frameworks to break down on it, or like I said, have that third party. Now, I, I can't really answer the question about the voters um, with the, and then the national ID program. That's kind of scary, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I can say that if you create the tech, if you create the system in a way that obfuscates people's identity, you can design it so that no one entity has access to everyone's data, but it doesn't sound like that's happening. Okay. He first, and then you, you'll be next. Okay. Uh, hi, Alan. Uh, I'm Jess. I'm an economist from the Philippine Competition Commission. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, in, in, you were talking about how public sectors or government can use the blockchain technology. Are you aware of any... Uh, public office anywhere in the world where it has successfully migrated from an old technology to a blockchain one? And can you focus primarily on how did they, because the Genesis block, the first one, is crucial. For example, in the Philippines, a mid-size organization should be like 30 years. So that's 30 years worth of information that you had to verify, that you have to double check, multiple check. So, so, so that 30 years worth of information should be correct before adding on new ones onto it, given how blockchain works. So uh, do you have any uh, examples on how, uh, how they did it and where things that we can look into? Thank you. I would look to Singapore's implementation of blockchain around its uh, ID program. Um, I would also look to uh, Dubai, they have a, a, a good digital identity program that they created. Oftentimes, the, the, the burden on any of these systems, and it's what's happening in the US, like Illinois, uh, the government of Illinois created a blockchain system um, for birth certificates. Um, there's, I mean, there's a lot of successful public sector implementations of the technology in various applications. The biggest burden is the actual digitization of records which is why I wanted to separate that out. Because any government, no matter what, if you create a digital like framework for something, you're gonna reap insane benefits from it, whether that's in terms of efficiencies or uh, reduced costs or, or whatnot. And it will enable you to adopt other applications. But if you do not have a digitized system, a blockchain system wouldn't work, just fundamentally if that makes sense. So, so in most of these applications, especially public sector records, public records ones, most of the burden is in digitization. And if you don't have that dis digitization, you can never fully trust the record. Um, and so that's where it's at in most cases. Oftentimes, you see these systems springing up out of a system that doesn't exist. So. Uh, it'll be in uh, a developing country that has no identity system whatsoever, and they're immediately jumping to this, which is oftentimes the benefit of being um, like cloud first policies, right, in developing worlds, or developing countries, where they're able to immediately leapfrog over developed countries because they have this like ancient technology that they can't get rid of, right, and they're able to immediately jump into the the forefront. And we're going to continue to see that, especially around this technology, especially around digital identity solutions, I imagine. Um, but yeah, it, it really comes from digitization. So you either have to start from scratch, which most folks are doing, or already have the digital. If you have the digital, you can do it. Okay. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Oliver from the UP Law Center. Uh, I. I was also going to ask about successful or examples of governments adopting DLT, uh, but um, I, my follow-up questions are actually related to the thinking or the privacy architecture that may have b been taken into account in adopting these technologies. <coughs> uh, 
because well in the like for example in the Philippines we have I think a more uh, aggressive data privacy regime than in the United States and this is also true in Europe and several other jurisdictions and DLT as with any other digitization enterprise is able to facilitate the mass memorialization of data even just for memorialization sake without there being any conscious effort whether or not this particular data field, this particular information should even be recorded or digitized at all. So I'm curious about uh, in these examples of uh, where DLT technology has been adopted, how conscious have the government regulators been in designing a privacy architecture. And relatedly as well, um, there is this growing recognition around the world of the right to be forgotten, wherein which is a legal right and a legally enforceable right wherein citizens have the right to demand that data about, personal data about them that is uh, outdated, uh, not, not relevant for public purposes, can be taken offline and rendered inaccessible. Is considering that rendering data or information inaccessible is a, uh, or rather, totally erasing it is a virtual impossibility. Uh, does DLT accommodate the strict restriction of access to data if in case that there's a court order or like, or the like? Thank you. Great questions. A plus for him. Uh, this is something I talk about a lot in the report. Uh, so uh, if you go and look at the, again, the privacy or the policymaker's guide to blockchain available at itif.org, I talk about privacy a lot, especially the right to be forgotten. Great questions. First, um, did governments consider privacy when they're adopting this technology? I can fairly... I'm fairly sure that Dubai did not because they don't care about privacy very much. I, I talked to the, some of their government folks when they were adopting the technology. They didn't consider it at all. Um, other governments, I, Singapore has definitely considered it, I imagine, because they, they're very robust in their data privacy framework. But I can't, I wasn't in the minds of the regulators when they were doing that. Um, I will say that most blockchain systems, at least the, a lot of the providers that are creating the systems design them in a way so that they're privacy protective in the sense that it is the best practice and if adopting any blockchain application to never store personal information on a blockchain. Imagine creating a, a, per, a permanent record of something forever, right? You don't want to take a healthcare record, say I have a bum leg, and you put that healthcare record on a system that everyone immediately has access to. It's just not smart. So as I was talking with a, a gentleman who asked a question over here, oftentimes it's about storing it elsewhere and using the tokens on the blockchain to prove what it is or exchange it in a, a tertiary way. That's a very important. Um, so when we're talking about certain types of content that you're trying to take off of a blockchain, uh, there are the the Public blockchains is a no-go, right? If you're putting personal information on the Bitcoin blockchain, you're not going to be able to take it off. Full stop. Uh, there's instances of child pornography on the Bitcoin blockchain today, right? There's a certain types of content that need to be taken off, cannot be removed. So this is that's a very that's one question. Are we able to take stuff off? Uh, the on the private sector blockchains, uh, or not private, sorry, the private blockchains or permiss per permissible blockchains often are able to obfuscate or remove certain information, right? Um, and those are useful for complying with laws like the right to be forgotten. Now, really what it boils down to with a lot of these privacy laws, uh, as opposed to content regulation laws, which we can talk about in a second, um, is the definition of personal information. So if we're talking about any information that could be traced to you in any conceivable way, like GDPR, then yes, every single, technically, every single transaction on the Bitcoin block 
block ne uh, Bitcoin network or the Ethereum network or any of them, they all violate the right to be forgotten fundamentally or the right to deletion or, or erasure or any of those things because you cannot take that information off. It just can't be deleted. Um, now, if we're defining it as, well, it's a, it's not, it doesn't directly identify you. It can be linked to you, right, which is how it defines. But if it's not directly linked to you, then of course, right? But I don't think that GDPR was actually well thought out in the sense that, uh, I mean, it directly conflicts with other European laws around uh, like anti-money laundering protections, right? So if you look at it, uh, you have one law that says every bank has to keep a personal record of every transaction. And then another law that says every transaction should be deleted on request doesn't really work. So uh, it's, it becomes a definition, uh, question of definitions. Now with content regulation, such as copyright removal or the removal of harmful content, such as hate speech or um, pornography, uh, that becomes a real challenge when it comes to some of these applications, which is why you want to have a very tailored, specific blockchain application that you're trying to create. So it's whether it's a financial application or a content application. If it's content, then it should have editability written into the code, which is a challenge that governments will still have to tackle with. But we haven't addressed those questions uh, still to this day. Any more questions from the audience? Comments? Okay. Yes, Dr. Pakeo. Uh, this is actually addressed uh, to uh, our colleague in um, the UP law, and, and of course to you, because you're very experienced. I've, we, we just passed this privacy law, I think just after we passed freedom of information law. And the two are just yeah. conflicting. That's right. Where do you draw the line between the rights to public information, which is crucial to a functioning democracy, mm -hmm. and of course the need to protect privacy. your private lives and data. Well, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to give you an example of why I, you know, because we have been working, uh, we, we are researchers, so before it was so e easier to get information, to do surveys, etc., and even uh, information about students that you want to analyze, uh, and teachers, which is really like public, and yet you, they are using the privacy, privacy law to hide, not to release information. Um, I will say that FIPS, uh, Freedom of Information Acts, right, they're incredibly important to the, the health of any democracy, but they're targeted specifically at the public sector. So if you've given your information um, to a government, right, barring personally identifiable information in certain contexts such as employment or grant writing or certain circumstances, it should be applicable to the freedom of information. It's fundamental to a democracy. Um, However, not every piece of information, as I just cited, some of it is like like hiring information. So would it be okay to ask for every government employee's address, for example? You don't want that, even though the government has that information. So it's, it's granular, and I, I hope you can answer it also, but um, f I also work in privacy law. Um, it's, it's granular and context specific, uh, any privacy protection. So not only should privacy protections be about what information is being exchanged, it should be what is the context of that information. So even within health information, right, uh, it depends on what it is, whether it's, it's, it's uh, sensitive or not. Like uh, you can take my step count, right, for today, but if you wanna learn about my health history, both of which are health data points, right? They're different in their uh, privacy effects. 
uh, knowing that information. So, uh, sir. Uh, concerning the Philippine Data Privacy Act, <clears throat> for one, uh, there is a relatively broad exception to the applicability of the Data Privacy Act when it comes to their, the collection of data is for a public purpose. And if the public purpose has been established by prior law, um, then it would be construed in favor of accommodating the public purpose. One example would be the law that requires the recording of statements of assets and liabilities and allowing these, uh, the SAL-N to be made publicly available. Uh, so the Data Privacy Act, even if enacted much later than the SAL-N law, cannot be invoked in order to prevent, for example, the disclosure of the SAL-N. Now, it hasn't perhaps the, because the Data Privacy Act was enacted only in 2012, so perhaps it may have given an excuse, a, a recent excuse to avoid having to disclose information, but uh, if, uh, well, it, um, they can try to invoke it, but it, doesn't, it would not necessarily mean that uh, the refusal to disclose would be proper. Now, and although it may require some, uh, a complaint filed or some litigation in order to reveal that information. Now, uh, I understand that the research, that the specific question of research has been invoked as well, and I'm, uh, I'm not entirely sure about the context, but I know that it is a pending question when the, because there is also a research exception wherein the activities of researchers uh, is also um, under the law, at least uh, under the law that um, you know, activities of researchers is also exempt from the, from the coverage of the Data Privacy Act. But I understand that the regulator has interpreted this to include that it, there must be a public purpose or essentially a uh, some sort of public purpose benefit if i if not if i recall correctly in order for the application to for the exemption to apply and that has caused some controversy um, the thing is with the data privacy act since it's quite new in fact, there hasn't yet been any Supreme Court decision uh, interpreting the provisions of the Data Privacy Act. So we can expect that over the next few years, uh, there will, may be some further clarification from the courts as to uh, the proper interpretation of these provisions. But in the meantime, uh, most of the activity is with the National Privacy Commission and the interaction it has with various players of the uh, industry. And perhaps uh, as time goes along, as there's greater interchange between the NPC and uh, especially the private sector, the academic, the academe, uh, there may be further clarity on what these exceptions would mean. Any more comments from the audience? Oh, so there being none, I think we're just on time. So please join me in thanking. And thank you very much for your comments and your participation in this session.